Warm welcome to all of you to the uh, pumps and pipes session. Uh, I don't know how many of you attended the uh, keynote yesterday in the opening plenary. Uh, Mayor Anise Parker actually referred to pumps and pipes as one of the important things that Houston does uh, because of the different industries in Houston. So we have an exciting panel today, and to moderate that, it is my privilege to introduce Dr. William Klein. Dr. Klein is manager of the drilling and subsurface function of ExxonMobil upstream research company. He holds a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Michigan. An ExxonMobil employee since 1980, Bill has held a variety of research positions as well as assignments in drilling operations and drilling technology applications. Bill is a co-founder of Pumps and Pipes, a symposium series that brings together oil and gas and medical professionals to explore common interests and opportunities for collaboration. Just a little bit on his personal life, Bill and his wife Karen are the proud parents of five children whose career directions include teaching, art, music, and ministry, all enabled by Bill's association with the arts of well construction. So please help me welcome Dr. William Klein. Thank you, Mohan. Uh, I think I need to update that uh, resume. Uh, Pumps and Pipes is a collaboration of many most recently manned space flight. So how cool is this? And I promise you, you came to an interesting session. You might start tweeting your friends. Don't miss it. So good afternoon. It is a pleasure and an honor to be part of this gathering that reflects our greatest strength as a science and technology community. The fact that we are all globally connected, constantly sharing, and dedicated to inspiring innovation. And by the way, that would be today as well as tomorrow. So for that purpose, I'd like to welcome all of you to my hometown, Houston, Texas, energy capital of the world, home of manned space flight, and destination for the world's best medical care. Now, for those of you who have not been to Houston before, I hope you are able to tour the drilling rig display at Galveston and visit the rocket park at the Johnson Space Center. Um, I'd also really like for you to be able to see a, uh, the insides of a medical center operating room, but please be very careful how you get there. Okay. Uh, as far as how we live and work in Houston, you only need to know two things. And I think I've been, uh, If you get back to the beginning, I've been uh, tapping it's right the, there. yeah. It's right there. All right. You, you really only need to do two things. First, we are a community of neighbors who love poking around in each other's toolbox. And secondly, the common language we speak is right here, is pumps and pipes. This is exemplified by our logo, which I will modestly assert is among the world's coolest. Energy, medicine, and space flight are most definitely unique businesses. There's no doubt they are very different. But whether we are managing a refinery, a space station, or even a patient's heart, it's pumps and pipes that we have in common. So common ground, in turn, leads to conversation. Conversation fosters innovation. And innovation brings us to what we are all after, every one of us and that is differentiation. For example, on the left of this slide is an ExxonMobil laboratory where we study a well completion technique called gravel packing. Now we at ExxonMobil, no doubt, I'm sure Rustin will agree with this, are the best in the world at gravel packing and we work to develop that uh, expertise every day. And development involves improving the familiar. Discoveries, however, are made by looking beyond the familiar, such as when we checked our gravel pack into the Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. Here's our patient on the right 
about to undergo advanced magnetic resonance flow in imaging, which the medical profession is the, is the leaders, our neighbor's toolbox. So to be differentiating, we need to think differently. And for the next hour or so, I really hope we're going to be thinking dif differently. So it is now my privilege to introduce our panelists and some of the friends that I have the privilege of hanging out with as a technology professional in Houston, Texas. Uh, to my immediate left is uh, Steve Igo. Steve is director of the Entrepreneurial Institute and Cardio Design Laboratory at uh, Methodist Bakey Heart and, Vas Heart and Vascular Center and is co-director of the Pumps and Pipes program. Uh, he is uh, also a co-founder and former president of CoreMedics Corporation, a Texas life science company. He has authored many peer-reviewed scientific articles as a co-offender of a number of patents and is one of the, uh, the great interdisciplinary uh, minds of our time. And right now he is among the most busy of our time because we're going to have our pumps and pipes annual meeting on Monday. And I'm sure Steve has a part of his brain thinking, wow, man, what do I have to go do? So I appreciate him being here. To uh, Steve's left is uh, Rustam Modi, Vice President of Technology for Baker Hughes, one of our leading oil field uh, suppliers of technology. Rustam has more than 32 years experience in the area of drilling completions. He holds many patents and is, again, the author of numerous pu uh, uh, publications. Uh, he is a member of the Board of Advisors for the University of Oklahoma Engineering Department. And on my far left is uh, Kirk Shireman, Deputy Director of the Johnson Space Center. Uh, he works with uh, Center Director Ellen Ochoa to manage one of NASA's largest installations with nearly 14,000 civil service and contractor employees, including the White Sands Test Facility in New Mexico. He see, oversees a broad range of human spaceflight uh, activities. In fact, he also serves as the chair of the International Space Station Mission Management Team, where he's responsible for all aspects of on-orbit operations of the International Space Station. So as you can see, I am the hit of dinner parties, because I get to tell people about my friends in Houston, Texas. And it's a broad range of people like that. And all I can say every day when I consider technology in Houston is how cool is this? And that's what I hope that uh, we'll be talking about for the next hour. So what I would like to do, this is a panel session. I'd like to have each of my friends here give about a 10 minute or so opening statement about this topic of the other guy's toolbox. Then we're gonna ask some questions, some provocative discussion, and be prepared out there in the audience to, uh, with, with your questions as well because this is a, uh, a really compelling topic, and these are really compelling panelists. So without further ado, I'd like to bring to the podium Steve Igo. Well, thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here today with you at the uh, IIT Global Conference. Uh, it's the first time I've been here. Um, what I would like to talk about today is um, um, kind of the beginnings of pumps and pipes and a couple of the collaborative programs that we have been involved in. Over the years, we've gone from one collaborative program which initially involved uh, Halliburton and employing some of their seismic software to look at some of the large data sets that we were obtaining from MR imaging of aortic dissection patients. Uh, since then, we've progressed through a number of other programs, and now we've actually inc incorporated challenge stations into our, into our program. So what we really are talking about here is the power of collaboration, or as one of our themes for one of our pumps and pipes programs was better together. So this power of collaboration can be t t um, looked at in, an, in, a, in another way of being the answer to my problem may be found in the other guy's toolbox. And this was really promoted back in uh, 2008 during the Pumps and Pipes uh, 2 uh, conference with uh, Dr. Lumsden and Dr. Klein kind of moving this forward. And we've stuck with this theme over the years. This is our seventh year this year for the Pumps and Pipes uh, conference. So the concept, 
was to bring together um, individuals, primarily uh, physicians, cardiac surgeons, uh, engineers, um, from Houston's largest industries, and that would be the oil and gas industry, uh, the medical center, and now, of course, now the aerospace industry uh, that we brought in last year. Our goal is to find ways of, of working together, collaborating, and finding ways of uh, exploring these potential crossover technologies and pursuing new ideas. So let me talk about one of these. We call it the heartbeat simulator. At Methodist, we were very interested in uh, evaluating new heart valve designs, new vascular graphs, and such things as that. These are very hard to model in animals, certainly, and uh, you can't really, uh, every patient individually is different. So we needed to design a system that would allow us to test these new heart valve designs, and I, I would just pause and say, by that I mean, it used to be you had to open the patient's chest, put them on the heart-lung machine, open their heart, and sew in a valve. We don't do that anymore. We put a catheter in the groin, and the catheter goes in like a stent, it's deployed. These patients usually go home three or four days later. So it's minimally invasive. You don't even go into the chest anymore. So we needed to evaluate these designs. During one of our, our programs we call Leadership Grand Rounds, Bill and his engineers came over to Methodist. And we kind of took them back scene. And we were explaining some of our problems that we had. And one was to develop this heartbeat simulator. So we brought a team together. We had medical people that were involved and knew about heart function. We brought together a team from oil and gas that knew a lot about control and display that we didn't. And then mathematical analysis, we brought in folks from the University of Houston. Well, this is what Bill's team designed for us. What you're looking there on the screen is one heartbeat. You have the ejection of the heartbeat. If I can get the pointer to work, maybe not. The, the ejection occurs from the top uh, left to the bottom. That's when the heart is contracting. Then you have a period from the, the lower part of that curve to the upper right. That's when the heart is filling. What we, could, what we could do in that one heartbeat is control the profile of that filling and ejection. We could do that over and over and over again. And this is, this is something we couldn't get by any other uh, method that we had tried beforehand. We had felt that what we wanted to use was a linear actuator. We didn't know how to program it. We didn't know how to create that software that you just saw. One of Bill's engineers did. And literally over a Christmas and Thanksgiving, or Christmas and New Year's um, uh, holiday, he worked many, many hours to create that software. And we now can test heart valves, vascular grafts, blood pumps, and we can and test them in, a, in, a, in an environment that's quite unique. This is the system, the cart that uh, Bill's engineers built for us uh, with the computer on the top and all the uh, uh, controlling um, uh, devices below, and it's coupled by a very long shaft into what we call a mock circulation. Uh, we had tried different methods of, of doing this, and the, and the long shaft actually worked out to be the best. Now over there on the, uh, on the right, you'll see the, the MR magnet. It's very powerful. You get anything metallic close to it, it just gets sucked into it. But what we found out was we could park this uh, uh, control cart outside the gauze line, uh, which is uh, shown by this different colored tile on the floor. And what we were able to do is, is actuate our mock circulation by this very long uh, drive shaft to the heartbeat simulator. This is what the mock circulation looks like. At the very bottom is what I want to bring your attention to. There's a, there's a heart ventricle here, uh, filling and, and uh, uh, compliance chambers. But at the bottom is our imaging chamber for looking at heart valve uh, function. And this is an example of one of the um, images that we obtained in the MR machine looking at 4D flow analysis of flow through a heart valve. So we can look at different velocities. Particularly, we can look at regurgitant volumes. This is important in heart valve uh, replacement. You don't want a leaky valve. So we're actually able to use patient-specific models of aortas or of the heart 
and test these uh, devices to assure that they are functioning normally. This is another kind of view of, of the, uh, the imaging chamber, uh, and it has flow pr profiles very similar to what occur in your own heart. Well, I think Bill had ulterior motives. He knew that uh, we wanted to do this imaging work, and he was uh, very helpful to us to get, our, to get our program off the ground, which has resulted in a number of, of publications and, and grants now. But mostly, he wa really wanted to, to use our imaging capability to study uh, the flow in the, in the gravel pack in a, in a model of a well bore. So I'm not going to bore you with, with this. You, you are all familiar with how this works in terms of, of getting the, the well bore uh, drilled and then uh, ultimately to the, the, to the screening and the casing. But what we want to point out here is this model that was built. Um, and it um, is a pretty good representation of, of what uh, uh, the, the well bore looks like. Um, and here it is positioned inside our a new three Tesla magnet. When we did this study, the magnet had only been in place for three weeks. We hadn't even put a patient in this thing yet. And as you can see, it's wrapped in a shower curtain. Uh, you have these very long uh, and, and uh, large tubes that was connected to a pump. We pumped hundreds of gallons of water through this over the course of a couple of hours. And if, if we had uh, sprung a leak in that magnet, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today. We didn't, we didn't lose a drop. We didn't lose one drop of water. And what we were able to attain were these images. And uh, I think that, that Bill would admit he, he had no idea really what these images were going to look like. In, in progressing through simple 2D slices uh, through, the, uh, through the model to more complex 3D views. Well, these were images that had never been seen before. Looking at these uh, uh, flow and velocity profiles coming through the simulated gravel pack. We were able to do velocity profiling. And then, of course, Bill's group um, really tweaked it, and, and we went to these uh, beautiful 4D images, uh, in, including color coding of each individual inflow point. This is a, this is a rotation of this uh, in, a, in a different view. Using this kind of information may allow more optimization of of, uh, of oil wells. You can really, you can really get close-up views. You can really distinguish the, the separate flow uh, velocities uh, as, as flow enters uh, into the pipe. So here's a picture of the patient um, uh, in the middle. And the, the imaging team, the team of engineers from ExxonMobil, we took this in the lobby of uh, at Methodist Hospital, so that's the statue of Dr. DeBakey there. We thought that was very appropriate to have Dr. DeBakey, uh, who did so much work in developing heart and blood vessel uh, surgery, to, uh, to pose with the, uh, the patient from ExxonMobil. So I, I'd really like to play a short movie here and let Bill and Dr. Lumsden explain a little bit more about the Pumps and Pipes program. Thank you. 
pumps and pipes. Bill, thank you very much for creating this wonderful program and allowing me to be a part of it. Thank you, Steve. Steve talked about the concept of the solution to my problem may very well be in the other guy's toolbox. Next, I'd like to, our, for our next uh, panelist, I'd like to introduce Rustam Modi, who is probably the number one practitioner of uh, dipping into the other guy's toolbox and creating breakthroughs. Rustam has uh, been the father and the advocate of several of them, which I can tell you in my day job, I most definitely benefit. So without further ado, Rustam. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity this afternoon to talk about uh, the pumps and pipes. It's, it's truly an amazing uh, symposium that's been put together where we learn a lot from just discussing each other's problems and different solutions and things like that. And I want to just talk briefly about how we have implemented different technologies and enhanced it for our needs within the industry. I want to start with just a basic uh, overview uh, for my colleagues who are not from the energy industry. Trust me when I say easy oil is all gone. There's nothing like easy oil left anymore in the world. And to explore these harsh environments, you have to develop new technology and stay at the cutting edge. Especially when you talk about deep water, ultra deep, heavy oil, those kind of things. So designing technology that can be reliably used is very critical. As technology leaders within the energy industry, it's very critical for us to balance our portfolio because we got to look at our short-term needs as well as involve the energy and resources for game-changing technologies. So it's all about balancing our portfolio between uh, today's needs and the future potential needs that we see in industry. So the way we look at it is, we look at two critical factors. Of course, we want to make money because we are a for-profit organization. But a couple of things we'll look at technology that will really help us is we want to reduce the risk factor. Especially when you start going into harsh environments, deeper wells, reliability becomes a big thing. Another thing we look at technology is how can it increase our efficiency? In other words, what can we do to simplify the operation and reduce the non-productive time? Most of the offshore rigs run about a half a million, a million dollars a day rental. Keep in mind, if it takes three days to trip a well out and in, that's a lot of non-productive time. So we try to look at these factors, and for the four categories we focus on is sustainable energy chemistry, high performance information, advanced measurements, and designer materials. And all these four baskets of technology are going to be applied into deep water, unconventional, and conventional. When I say unconventional, I'm talking about shale energy. So I'm going to use an example of deep water, how reaching out into the other industry, in the other person's toolbox, we've been able to bring in technology, enhance it for our specific needs. To give you some of your colleagues uh, who are not part of the energy industry, uh, on the left you see a deep water well that's been superimposed over Manhattan, New York. That gives you a level of complexity of what we're talking about. And those directional wells it, uh, that, that shows, basically it can reach a particular specific address in Manhattan downtown for that accuracy, within a couple of meters. So there's a lot of technology put into horizontal drilling, directional drilling, that helps search reach those things. And the right, you see the complexity of drilling in deep water. And here I've tried to improve the depth of the water over the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa. It gives you a feel that we are drilling in 10,000 feet of water which is four times the height of those towers, and drilling to 30,000 feet below, which is 11 times. That kind of gives you a complexity of the technologies involved in bringing all to the surface. So on the drilling side, really this slide doesn't do justice. But there's so much involved in it in direction drilling. 
And one of the techniques we use is what we call as a rotary storable systems and measuring while drilling. As we are drilling long horizontal wells, like during the luncheon we talked about in the chocolate, drilling five and six miles long, and perfectly placing the wells at the right depth, in the right orientation, to the right target, it takes a lot of sophisticated technology, like for example, a direction drilling tool. So while you're drilling, you measure the formation as you're drilling, and communicating that information to the surface, giving it feedback, and adjusting the traje trajectory of your, of your drill bit. So if you go from right to left, in the drill bit itself, there's so many technologies developed to enhance the performance of the rock bit. Because remember, the rock bit gets dull. Guess what? You got to trip out 30,000 feet out to the surface. And nobody's happy to do that. So you got to increase the life of the rock bit. All the electronics that go in a downhole tools at those high temperatures, they have to be reliable and functioning every time. It's a whole array of technologies within that thing. It all comes down to placing the well exactly where you need, drilling a perfect hole, because after you drill the well, you've got to complete it. So now I'll bring you to a whole different kind of technology that we are working on. We call it a living completion. We want to take that formation, make it live like a human body, so we can monitor the performance of the well bore, look at what's happening down hole, communicate that information to the surface, and make the necessary adjustments, like you're doing with a human body. You've got to be able to understand what's going on and accordingly monitor the performance, change the depletion profile of the well board, and get the maximum output from it. So a lot of technology has been put into it that can be covered. But I'm going to cover just a couple of things. Here we have, as an organization, we work with a lot of universities, a lot of different organizations like the Energy Rubber Group, ASME, what we encourage within our researchers is go beyond the energy industry. Export publications from the Rubber Institute, from American Society of Mechanical Engineers, other industries where you can get that knowledge and then wonder how you can apply within our technology. And of course, pumps and pipes. It has just been an amazing experience for me working in this particular symposium or being able to exchange information with the medical society. One thing we have done, we work very closely with Rice University, which is the hub of near technology activity. And working through the Rice University, we've been able to form our own nanotechnology research facility at the technology center I work at, where we're exploring the use of nanotechnology in understanding the reservoir and formation evaluation, designing drill bits that have greater wear resistance with different configuration of PDC diamonds, Improving about fiber optics we use down hole to understand what's going on. Developing new completion techniques, new materials. So all of these are interrelated where we try to bring these technologies to enhance the performance of equipment. And I'll give an example of this particular material. It's a new generation of metal which are designed to be lighted as light as phenolic or plastic by the strength of steel. And we're using these kind of materials, using air technology, to design our completion system. So after the completion is performed, or the task is performed, with a proper simulation or stimulation, this material basically dissolves and disappears away. And we use these kind of materials in a lot of different applications to reduce non-productive time by making our equipment much more efficient. Again, based upon the knowledge we have gained working with academia, with other industries in bringing the technology within the workplace. Another such example is a shape memory polymer. Bill briefly talked about gravel packing. Gravel packing is something that's done to reduce sand production when you're producing oil. It's like a filter you build around your completion. But this shape memory foam is designed where it swells out and touches the formation and basically has a potential of completely eliminating gravel packing. It's an open cell structure, simple to use, and triggered when it want to, want to be activated. So it basically swells up and isolates the well bore. Now how did this technology come about? It came about because one of our scientists was reading a elastomer publication from another industry that talked about shape memory polymer. 
And we wanted to use this material to make conventional packing elements. These are elements or elastome elements that swell out and are sort of available under high temperature and pressure. That turned out to be in our initial testing we were doing, this material would swell out and isolate, but it would leak over time. And it drove our engineers completely crazy as to why does this particular material does not have pressure integrity. One of our senior fellows looked at this material and said, you know what, I have another application for this. I can make it leak to my desired leak rate and act like a filter and create a packing element that acts like a screen that isolates sand and just produces oil. Suddenly a different way of looking at things, just because it did not work in one solution, doesn't mean the technology cannot be applied to another one. Just I talked about intermetallic material in the previous slide, the dissolving material. It was first engineered to be a protective coating to increase the wear resistance. And where we were doing experiments, we found out that it did act like a wear resistance, but when it was exposed to brine, which is a completion fluid, it would dissolve away. So engineers were getting frustrated that we cannot use this material for this application. But when you stand back and look at that material, you found different applications for it. So my message over is very simple. Just because something does not work for a given application, there's a potential for the characteristics to be used in completely different applications. So be open-minded. And last but not least, fiber optics. There's a huge demand for fiber optics for high temperature application down all conditions. The fibers we use are very different than what's in the communication business. These fibers are specially treated to be protect from hydrogen effects on the fiber. These fibers are used to measure pressure, temperature, and stress downhole. So we work with universities. This technology came from the military that we incorporate into our business. So we're always looking at other industries of how to bring these technologies and enhance what we are doing. We are first completely fiber optic completion that was installed for Shell in the Mars A16 platform. 30,000 feet below, where you actually install the completion and make an optical wet connect where you're connecting two fibers together at that particular depth. Again, this is technology that changes how we do things in the industry. And last but not least, our biggest problem is data, big data. And this is where our collaboration with, the, with NASA, with the medical society, who are used to dealing with big data. Bill talked about working with Halliburton in terms of analyzing big data. So big data is a huge, huge problem. As we are drilling deeper and deeper and collecting more information, it becomes absolutely critical that we understand how to manage this data to improve our overall performance and take that information and act on it accordingly. So I hope I've given you a basic flavor of how we are bridging across from the energy to the other industries through working to academia in terms of bringing new technology. At the end of the day, I just want to leave you with this quote. Thomas Edison was asked a wise particular project is working was not producing results. And this was a statement. It says, results, why man, I've got a lot of results. I know several thousands things that don't work. The message I have on this one is the things that did not work, if you look at it a little more closer, you might find a jewel in that particular technology that can be used somewhere else. But invention and technology development is just one thing. At the end of the day, this is very critical. So my single message to everyone is, just remember one thing. Innovation without execution is So we can develop technology day in and day out. But you've got to be smart enough to implement it, execute it, because at the end of the day, we are in the business of making money. With that, thank you for your time and everything. Thank you. As I was uh, listening to Rustam, I realized that uh, he and I share a, a small moment in history. A couple of years ago, our pumps and pipes group went to a, a game for the Houston Astros baseball team. I think Steve organized it. And uh, we chatted. I know I had a good conversation with Rustam. And 
you know what? That might have been the last time the Houston Astros actually won a baseball game. So, all right. <laughs> We talked about uh, the other guy's toolbox, uh, finding the solutions. We talked about changing the game with the other guy's toolbox. Now I want to bring up a representative who is the other guy's toolbox. Uh, NASA has an amazing legacy, not the least of spinning off all sorts of technologies, and I'm sure every one of you have one in your pocket today in some way or form. So I'd like to introduce Kurt Shireman, and he was going to talk about that uh, being the other guy's toolbox. Kurt? Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, actually, in the reality, we like to think of ourselves as, as not only the other guy's toolbox, but we like to take tools out of their toolbox as well, and hopefully I'll, uh, I'll convince you of that. At Johnson, uh, so I'm the deputy director of NASA's Johnson Space Center. At, uh, at NASA, our, uh, our goals, our vision is to lead human spaceflight, lead internationally, excel in leadership, management, innovation, and expand relevance to Earth. And I contend you really can't do all these things without the help of the other guy's toolbox. Uh, and you really can't do those things without creating a few tools in your toolbox that others can use as well. Today, NASA's budget accounts for about one half of one penny of every dollar, uh, every tax dollar that, uh, that the government takes in. Uh, oh. About one half of one penny for every tax dollar that's spent. Um, so in order to do NASA's mission, in order to fly the International Space Station, in order to explore beyond low Earth orbit, um, it's mandatory that we make things affordable. And uh, not only are we expanding technology, but we have to make it expand it in such a way that uh, it makes it affordable. When you do these things, it's useful not only to NASA, but it's useful to com companies here on the, on the planet. JSC is the home of about, uh, as you heard, about 3,000, a little over 3,000 civil servants and uh, a little over 11,000 contractors. To, Houston is the home of the International Space Station program. Uh, it involves five different agencies and 15 countries around the world. Today, six people live on board the International Space Station. And in fact, if somehow magically the sky is clear, you can see the space station fly over tonight at 7 p.m. from the west-southwest. Um, many nights, it doesn't matter really where you are in the world, uh, you can see it fly over. If you go to nasa.gov and look for uh, sighting opportunities, you can see it. You can be in a bright city or out in the country, and you'll still be able to see it. It's extremely bright. Um, so I really what I'd like to do is to show you a, a, a little brief video here about uh, technology that was developed and used on the International Space Station, and it's being here used on the planet and uh, as an example, uh, and probably much better, more eloquent than I could say. So let me uh, get that video up. For generations, we dreamed about a place to live and work in space. A place where life up there would benefit life down here. Today, that dream has come true. Research on the International Space Station improves lives all over the world. The station's benefits for humanity grow every day. And they can be told by the lives that have been changed. And 
he thought it was near his mitosa, which I have. We didn't even realize what that was. We'd always heard it called the ultimate disease. There's different uh, types of neurocarbonitosis. One of them, the tumors go on the outside of your skin. The other one, the tumors go on the inside. And hers go on the inside. A long time ago, when we were thinking about this, we approached uh, McDonald's Dental and Associates. It's a company that happens to be located in Canada that build uh, robots for space. They built what Canadians call Canada Arm, and then they constructed the special purpose specialist manipulator for the International Space Station. And the idea was, if they could build such complex robots, perhaps in collaboration with medicine, we could build a robot that could operate inside an MRI machine. We did not realize that it was um, built of the same material as the space arm, and uh, we're quite amazed that it, that's what he had made it of. But it's the multi dexterity of the robot, and that, that robot could perform tasks that made us um, become increasingly confident that we could overcome the challenges related to building a robot that could operate inside an MRI machine with the precision, the accuracy, and the dexterity of a neurosurgeon. It just so happened that the first individual was a young woman, and the young woman harbored a fairly complex tumor underneath the front part of her brain. A machine like Neuron can manipulate tools at an accuracy of 50 microns. That is overwhelmingly superior to what the best surgeon can do. I think it's fabulous and to me it's actually mind-boggling that someone can take that material and put it into um, a life-saving device that can help millions of people. I honestly think that right now I'd be better and I would not be able to get out of bed if it was not for my daughter. My parents would be taking care I guess like I'm glad that it hopefully helps people who have my disease and I hope that it helps people who need surgery in the future. If they're ever propositioned with a chance in the future to have something done like this, I hope they take it. NASA and the international partners did not set out to build a robot to build technology that would help neurosurgery. Let me see if I can stop this. For generations, we dreamed about a place to live and work in space. There we go. A place where life. We did not set out to build a robot or technology that could help in neurosurgery, and yet the same technology that was used to uh, build a robot that helped assemble the International Space Station helped. Uh, with surgery here on Earth. Johnson Space Center is also building the Orion vehicle, which will be a form of transportation to uh, four crew members to leave not only the Earth, but to leave low Earth orbit to actually travel farther than humans have ever traveled before. It will be able to supply those humans with all they need for 21 days living out in space and return them to Earth. When they return to Earth, they'll be traveling faster than humans have ever traveled and they'll reach temperatures, not the astronauts, but the vehicle will reach temperatures of over 4,000 degrees centigrade. And they'll land in the Pacific Ocean right off the coast of Southern California. NASA works in very extreme environments. You heard about uh, downwell uh, uh, environments, which are also extreme. And you can see how there might be synergism there. So traveling and working in uh, and living in space in an extreme environment, to address these environments and hazards and, uh, and to um, address all these issues, it creates opportunities, not only for NASA, but for other industries. One of the things we're working with a company here in Houston called uh, Astro Technologies, Inc., which is putting, uh, using NASA sensors and technology to uh, go on the legs of a uh, oil rig, offshore oil rig, and allow that data to come back up to manage that rig. Um, again, these sensors are now much easier to install. They can be done, the sensors were used on orbit, 
and could be installed with a, a human inside a spacesuit, and now they can be applied by uh, divers on, uh, on the legs of a rig uh, very cheaply and effectively. Out at NASA, we have a giant pool. Um, uh, to give you an idea, it's about 80 meters long, 40 meters wide, and about 13 meters deep. We use that pool, and in, inside that pool actually is a mock-up of the International Space Station. We use it to train the astronauts to do spacewalks on board the International Space Station. The company that operates that pool for us, Raytheon, actually has a partnership with Petrofax, whose training uh, uses one part of the swim pool to actually train um, offshore drill workers what to do in the event they, uh, they have to uh, land their helicopter in the water. And actually, uh, many offshore companies are training their uh, offshore oil workers how to react in that situation and save lives. So again, the toolbox is not necessarily only technologies, but in some cases, it's uh, facilities, just like in this case. The ISS is flying about uh, 240 miles overhead, traveling 17,500 miles an hour. It weighs close to a million pounds. We swap crews out in groups of three for about every 180 days. So three people stay up there about 180 days, they come home, three people stay up there, and we send another group. Um, believe it or not, it's not possible to have all the medical technology and expertise that we have here on the ground available to our astronauts up there. Um, and so telemedicine becomes a really huge deal for us. And so NASA has worked with uh, physicians here on the planet to work on telemedicine so that we can make sure our astronauts um, are, are healthy on orbit and we can diagnose uh, specific issues. Uh, while our astronaut population tends to be very, very healthy, when we launch them, we go through great, uh, great uh, uh, links to make sure we choose healthy people and train them to be healthy before they're launched. Their bodies undergo uh, very, very significant changes when they're on orbit. And so understanding those is really important. Diagnostic, medical diagnostic technology is really, really important. But we don't have the ability to fly all those things. We can't launch one of these giant MRI machines, uh, unfortunately, uh, into space. And so ultrasounds and other telemedicine is uh, really, really important for the International Space Station. Also monitoring the air quality and the water quality is really, really important up there in that closed environment. And you can see here on the planet, measuring air quality and water quality might be very significant uh, issues too. So uh, other opportunities for us to collaborate. The list goes on and on about things that are done in space that could lend themselves to, here, uh, to, to other opportunities here on the ground. But really, more importantly, the list continues to grow. It's really, really important that we talk with one another where we're building a technology for our purposes. We don't necessarily have the expertise, the knowledge to see how that technology could apply to other industries. And that's why pumps and pipes is such a fantastic thing. And the opposite is true as well, where we need to have, we have a significant problem. We need to solve it for human space flight. Actually, those opportunities uh, and technologies might exist here on the planet already, and we can just use those same technologies that exist at a fraction of the cost. And as I said previously, cost is a really, really important thing as we move forward to uh, explore beyond low Earth orbit. So again, in, uh, in summary, we're really, really pleased to be here. I'm very proud to be here and be part of this discussion. And uh, NASA is very pr proud to be part of Pumps and Pipes. So thanks for your attention and look forward to your questions. And thank you. And you know, seeing that video, I speak to a lot of young people about uh, science and technology careers and try to encourage them to do those things. And that, that video sums it up. I am very proud to be a technical professional and to be able to associate with people like this and y'all. We do make a difference in the world. Now comes the good part of this, uh, the great part of this, uh, 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 this gathering, the, the panel discussion, as we get to unlock the minds of uh, of these uh, really forward-thinking individuals as well as yours. So uh, uh, I'm gonna, the format is I'm going to pose some questions. Uh, I've got three of them. We're going to discuss those. But I hope we have time at the end uh, be formulated some of your questions, because this is a real opportunity. Um, He's going to, we're going to have the, the question on the, on the screen here, but I'm going to go ahead and a, a ask it by the first one. This one is really foremost in my mind. You know, we do a lot of borrowing of technology, but we also have to do a lot of qualification of technology because all of us 
especially the people in this panel, are in zero margin for air businesses. Um, just th think about the nature of these businesses. They have people's lives, even national priorities in their hands. So my question to you all is, how does this incredible responsibility of you got to get it right shape how you about acquiring technology? Kirk, let's start, start with you. So every aspect of your business is under the public spotlight and uh, incredible responsibility. So it's really important for us to test those things and test them as cheaply as we can uh, and test them in the environment that uh, they're going to see. And so uh, that's why uh, the International Space Station is such a wonderful place. Uh, it allows us to test those, uh, some of those technologies before we put them on the next space vehicle where they'll actually human lives will depend on them. So um, I guess the points I really want to make one is technology for, for us at this point in time for zero margin is we have to test it, test it very thoroughly, test it in the environment it's going to, uh, going to uh, face. Um, it also, because uh, mass is key, they have to be lightweight. Energy is key in the orbit too, they have, to have low energy. And so uh, those are the technologies we're really, really focusing on. How can we be extremely reliable, lightweight, low energy, and, uh, and work in the extreme environment that we have. And uh, again, one of the beautiful things about the space station is it, it now is a great platform for us to te test those technologies that we'll need to go in, uh, in human space vehicles that go beyond low Earth orbit. One of the things when you fly a, an Orion vehicle like I discussed before, um, today on board the International Space Station, the part breaks, and within a month or two, another supply vehicle is coming up and you can bring that part. It's a somewhat inconvenient. You have to wait for a month or two, but at least you can get there. And most likely, there's a spare part on board. When you fly a tiny capsule off off the planet farther than anyone's ever flown before, first of all, you don't have any room for any spare parts. And second of all, there is no supply ship coming to, uh, to bring you spare parts. And so, having it work, in fact, people's lives will depend on it uh, in the future. So that's why uh, that's why those things are. Thank you. Let me ask a follow-up question to that. Uh, as you go about the qualification and the testing process, is there an important role for outsiders? In our business, we call it cold eyes to take a look at it and, and see if there's any anything that they see that you may not. Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, I could go on for, for hours. I, I won't, but I could. Uh, right now, we, had a, we recently had a failure with the space suit. Some of you may have, uh, may have heard about it. In a spacewalk uh, this summer, actually, uh, the, the cooling which is really, really important in space because uh, convection doesn't work. You have to pass liquid through, uh, through the suit to, uh, to cool the astronaut. We started having a leak and pumped water, which behaves differently in space. It forms a little ball, and it formed right over the crew member's face. And, uh, and actually, literally, you could drown in a liter of water. Uh, we had a situation where water was being pumped into, uh, into the space suit uh, and uh, had to terminate the EDA spacewalk and bring the crew back inside. Uh, by the time he got inside, he, he couldn't see or hear anymore. It was, it was really a quite critical situation. The, that suit, the failure on that suit, was very, very unique. We brought the spare part, we brought a part home. Uh, it arrived here on Earth uh, in uh, mid-November. Uh, mid and uh, we have a team that's from universities, it's from uh, material specialists from all over the country who are helping us understand exactly the failure that we had with this particular part. So we go well outside the, uh, the space industry, uh, especially where we don't have the expertise. In this particular case, we had some contamination, non-biological con contamination grow that, uh, that plugged up some of the tiny hmm. orifices which caused the water to, uh, water to escape. And, uh, and so we're looking for uh, people from all over uh, who have this expertise to help us understand 
in and, and fix the, the, the problem. Right. Thank you. You know, Rustam, in, in our business, when uh, when we have a make a mistake, it can be quite serious, and we are also in the zero margin for error business. Um, and therefore, uh, we do have a tendency of we want to engineer it, engineer it again, and do it ourselves. In your business, how does that affect how you acquire technology from the outside and are confident that it's going to meet our needs? Thank you. Steve, in your business, there's always a family in the waiting room. How do you address that problem of uh, zero margin for error? Well, we've heard a little bit about acquiring technologies and uh, working in hostile environments. Um, the hostile environment that we work in in medicine not only involves certainly from an engineering point of view, uh, the, the, the devices we work with, but also in the environment that we put these devices into, into the bloodstream uh, and such things as that. So blood damage um, and blood clotting are uh, areas that we pay a lot of attention to. Um, as we move forward in, in, in healthcare in this country, we're gonna, we're gonna move into areas where um, we're becoming more interventional, uh, meaning less invasive surgery, minimally invasive surgery. Um, and these are our targets that we're looking at. When uh, Dr. Lumsden and I went out and visited Rustin's laboratories, we were struck by a comment that he made. They do a lot of work in, with materials. In cardiac surgery, we use a lot of materials, whether it be fabric, metals, shaped memory metals, uh, we use them all, but it, it, a comment that, that Rustin made that really struck home to us, he called his materials environmentally friendly. And for us, we immediately thought biocompatibility. It may be two different words, but we're really talking about the same thing. And so it, it struck us that we should be working with Rustin on these materials. Um, I think that all of these can be applied to how we treat patients better, and uh, uh, whether it be using, uh, I'll just take one example, acquiring new technology. You, think, you may have all heard of stents. Now these stents are uh, employed to prop open blood vessels. They can be very tiny blood vessels, um, where flow is, is a difficult situation. Bill introduced us to the concept of flow assurance. 
And now we use that all the time in terms of talking about when we do surgery on patients. It's all about flow assurance. But Rustam's working on this incredible metal. Um, right now, stents are basically there for the rest of your life. You put that stent in, or stainless steel, or nitinol, they are there forever. In fact, you only need the stent vessel for probably a month or two. So having the ability of using a high strength metal to prop a vessel open for one or two months and then allow it to dissolve has a great deal of applications in medicine. We're excited about that. So acquiring technology, we're constantly looking in the other guy's toolkit, especially here in Houston. In July, end of July, July 31st, July 29th it was, uh, we had a pumps and pipes program at JFC and it was at the Mutual Buoyancy Lab. And in fact, the two astronauts that were in the pool that day were working that problem of water in the helmet. So it's amazing how when we talk about these things, we can really relate to one another as we become involved with more and more with this pumps and pipes program. Good. Thank you. Let me just wrap this question up by giving a shout out to uh, IIT. Uh, we hire a number of IIT graduates, and uh, whenever a, a, a new employee comes to my office to start in my group, I tell them the same thing. It's, you're not really here for us to tell you what to do. Of course, you are here to tell us what to do. Because what we're really looking for is not a particular expertise in an area, a functional area. That's our business. What we're looking for is a broad range education, the ability to think critically, and the ability to look behind the scenes, and that's exactly it. So that's the ability that we need when we look into the other guy's toolkit. And that's what really mitigates discovery. It's one thing to discover, it's the other thing to discover and, and apply. So with that, I'm gonna transition uh, to our question two. And this is about uh, fostering a collaborative or interdisciplinary characteristic in everything we do. So the question to all of you is how do you see that, especially thinking of your new graduates that are joining your organizations, how do you see that the education system is fostering this interdisciplinary outlook and how can it be improved? Let's go back to you, Kurt. Actually, a lot of universities I know here in the United States are, uh, are, have set up interdisciplinary centers, and so they actually have graduate programs and, and, and create a center where people from different disciplines get together and work uh, in a graduate program. I was just visiting the University of Texas. I know they have a, such a, a, a center for a co computational activity. So they had engineers and scientists and computer scientists all working uh, on uh, enhancing uh, computational for JSC, the way we look for that, actually, we, uh, the way we encourage it, actually, NASA hires, uh, most of NASA's new hires are actually cooperative education students. And so we have students come in and uh, we'll work in a specific area. But then we actually ask them the next time they come to work in a different area. And in many cases, it's not necessarily even the same discipline uh, for which they're studying in school. And so our idea is let's bring them in, let's show them some different areas and get their, uh, get their, certainly get their perspective on it, but encourage them to look across different areas. Uh, as you said, I think it's really key. The, uh, we get a lot of, we get a lot out of our students. They, they teach us probably just as much as we teach our students. They bring a fresh perspective. Um, they bring the latest thing from universities, uh, but they also, uh, they also can, uh, can learn from multiple areas, which is, uh, really, really important in finding solutions. Um, we're also working on, uh, so in some cases we have co-op students who come here. We're also working cooperatively with universities and, and, and other industries. Uh, we have, right now we're building a robot for, for, to work in a, uh, a defense department research uh, uh, challenge, a DARPA challenge. That, uh, that robot's being built together with NASA, uh, several universities, including the University of Texas, and and also uh, General Motors. And so, again, a multidisciplinary team to work on this DARPA challenge. NASA's really interested because that's a humanoid robotic robot that can actually perform things in space, things such as spacewalk, walk.
involved in you know, that uh, very hazardous environment, things we'd like to take people out of, at least to the maximum extent we can. So cooperating with, uh, with outside entities, again, helps us get that. Um, and with universities in particular, because then when they come to work with NASA, they've had that experience already. And finally, we're working with several universities about their curriculum, in other words, helping them develop what, uh, what they're teaching students. So uh, I know we have uh, a former NASA employee, Bonnie Dunbar, Dr. Bonnie Dunbar, who's worked in the University of Houston, uh, developing graduate aerospace engineering program at a school where they don't have an aerospace engineering undergraduate. So they'll have to be drawn, drawn from other, uh, other disciplines. He's also worked with uh, a number of universities about a system engineering uh, program, which is, again, very useful for NASA broad expertise, a broad sense of, uh, of study across many engineering disciplines and bringing them all together. So that's the, that's the way we attempt to do it here at NASA. And of course, we're always interested in learning how others do it and improving, uh, improving that, that, that capability. Okay, thank you. Rustin? One of the things we do in our industry is we hire our mechanical electrical engineers and petroleum engineers. And I have the privilege of serving on two engineering boards, both for the petroleum school and for the engineering school at Mission Oklahoma. And in my earlier board meetings, the question came up is, the on-time campus in, uh, recruiting for petroleum engineers in the high 90s and mechanical engineers was in the mid 60s. But you couldn't understand what was going on. And that's the kind of part about it saying, you know what, we have our mechanical engineers, we spend them, spend three years training them how to just sell petroleum. So they come up with zero experience. I don't even know what the petroleum industry does. So working with the deans of both the schools, we have established a core program. It's a five years master's program where the petroleum engineers that we hire get trained in mechanical engineering as a minor. And the mechanical engineers who graduate get trained with petroleum engineering courses along with industrial engineering courses like reliability, project men and other things. What we bring to the table is we provide our SMEs. We guarantee a three-year summer internship. It's a five-year program where the students get guaranteed internship for three years and they graduate with a master's in five years. So the benefit for us is we get new graduates now who know what we do, are trained in the petroleum background, and the petroleum engineers who we hire to work in the regions in the field who sometimes face mechanical problems have to put comfort into the handle this problem. So it's a win-win situation for the school, for the industry, and for the students especially, to make them much more compatible. And this is a model to be used by industry. Company just to step up. I promoted this model at University of Wyoming, at Texas A&M, at OSU, Oklahoma State University. And a lot of schools are getting open to this interdisciplinary training but it needs to be a situation where the students are encouraged to work on. That's just one example. About two years back, uh, during the downsizing of the space shuttle program, we were the first ones who went to NASA up in Clay Lake to interview some NASA engineers. And this was a six o'clock morning. Uh, I was there supposed to be interviewed by the local channel. And not being prepared for it, the guy sticks a mic in my face and says, NASA is all about outer space. You guys are building the space all down in the earth. Why is this? Why are you standing over here interviewing NASA engineers? And thank God I had a cup of coffee that morning, so my neurons were connecting uh, very effectively. Yeah. So I looked at him and said, it's all about exploration. It, it takes a different mindset to be able to solve problems and exploring different frontiers. NASA engineers are thinking, to explore outer space, we are trying to explore down in the earth, but that mentality, the uniqueness, the quality required in engineers to explore, take risks, is no different. So the guy was quite taken back. My second interview at 7 o'clock, he uses my line, <laughs> but he introduces me. And so I told him, I said, after the meeting, he said, that, he says, well, one thing you learn about TV is all of our sound bites. <laughs> so uh, coming back to what? Uh, my colleagues said over here is it's all about interdisciplinary problem solving. You, you need, as you grow your career, you develop skill sets to look across, across other disciplines. And I think if we can modify or try and tweak our education.
education system, train our kids to learn different things and understand different mysteries. All they get when they graduate is the basic fundamental uh, knowledge of what engineering is. The rest is for industry to pick up. And selectively working together, we can achieve that goal. Thank you. Steve, how about the medical field? Well, um, I may back off a little bit from just pure medicine, because certainly biomedical engineers are, are involved in this. And here's my sound bite, Rustam. Uh, one of the things I always say about the pumps and pipes program is we go from inner space to outer space with stops in between. And I think that's what we're trying to do. Um, uh, Rice University, University of Houston, the medical schools in town have all been part of the pumps and pipes program from the very beginning. And you go to these, uh, you, but you go to, the, the, to a pumps and pipes conference and you may see a heart surgeon talking to an oil and gas engineer with an astronaut standing there. And oh, by the way, there's a high school student standing there as well. So that's what, maybe what I also want to talk about is science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM. We really embrace that in the Pumps and Pipes program. And the high school students have been a part of the Pumps and Pipes program for years now. And we embrace them, we bring them in, and they are um, so excited to be there, number one, but they tend to fire us up as well. HISD, Houston Independent School District, approached us last year and wanted to know how Pumps and Pipes could help them. And in, in February of last year, or this year, my goodness, it's a year. This year, in February, uh, we had a number of superintendents from HISD um, come down to the medical center. Bill was there, Dr. Lumsden was there, and they made their pitch. They wanted to present a, a proposal to the Department of Education. And they wanted to use the pumps and pipes concept of bringing different disciplines together as part of that proposal. We said, absolutely. Bill wrote a letter of recommendation. Dr. Lungston wrote a letter of recommendation. The grant uh, proposal was submitted in April. And in October of this year, we found out that the Department of Education had funded this program for $12 million. So we'll be able to start two programs, or HISD will be able to start two programs. One is a new magnet school, and one is a middle school to actually allow these students to be better prepared to move into the magnet school. So I think with some respects with pumps and pipes, we've reached even farther down uh, than just college students. We want to take it down into the high school level because I think that's where STEM education begins. This is where you can excite students in science and technology and medicine. Uh, I even call it now uh, uh, kind of STEM squared. Uh, we've added uh, medicine beyond uh, math. So uh, I think that for us in Pumps and Pipes, being able to uh, be involved with the high schools here in Houston, and, and maybe this can spread even farther. Uh, we do webcast our, our program. We can have, uh, I know that there'll be a couple of hundred students from around Texas uh, joining our Pumps and Pipes program live this year. They'll be able to see all of this. Your students from around the world could join in and watch the program this year as well. I encourage you to do that. So um, I think that's where all right. we would like to reach uh, more into the, the community with pumps and pipes. And I think this is a question we're all quite passionate about. You know, I would say from looking at the, the new graduates I saw that our, uh, our universities and grad schools do a very good job of preparing technical professionals. Where we all need to make an effort is in the feeding to that, the young people who are still making up their mind about science and technology. And that's why we produce these videos like that, that these, these young people need to know this is about helping people. This is about saving lives. This is about being launched into space. There is no career more productive or more satisfying than what we do. So my uh, plea to you to improve it is go out there, talk to young people, and make it known what we are doing, not only in your own individual disciplines, but we as a, as a, as a science and technology community. Which brings me to the third 
question I have here. And for you the, on the panel, this is your reward for participating. You want to talk about the other guy's toolbox, we have any number of toolboxes there of some of the foremost technical people in the world. And so as this, uh, uh, I guess I'm upside down on it. Is, uh, in this one, I want you to pose a question. Is there a problem that you are wrestling with now? Maybe somebody in this talented audience might already have solved. Now, since this is a question where you really get something back, I am gonna join in. So I'm gonna take the liberty of, uh, of posing the first question. Uh, like Rustam, I'm also in the, in the oil and gas business, and we drill deep into the ground and we're looking for hydrocarbon resources, and we're looking for hydrocarbon resources under pressure. There is one of the real technical challenges. So it is very important to us to measure pressure from a distance. We do all sorts of techniques, like send seismic waves down in the ground and interpret them and try to figure out what the pressure is. We've tried all sorts of things of pulsers on the bits to look ahead of the bit, but we're not there yet. If anybody, and we can talk about this afterwards, I'm not asking for a response now, but if you do, send up a note right now. Um, if anybody knows anything like that, that's the type of question that, that we are looking for, and we're really cultivating an inter, a, a interdisciplinary approach. Steve, do you have one in the, uh, in the, uh, in the cardiovascular field that uh, you've just been wrestling with, and you're looking into the other guy's toolbox? Yeah, there is. And I would say something about pressure for us. Mm -hmm. Patients with heart failure, we're always interested in what the pressures are in and around the heart. We actually have a very tiny little device now. We can actually inject into the uh, arteries, leave them in there, and, and it can beam out a, a signal and tell us what those pressures are in and around the heart. But here's my problem. Little tiny clots. Little tiny clots are what kill you. Little tiny clots in the coronary artery of your heart gives you a heart attack. Little tiny clots in the blood vessels going up to your brain uh, give you a stroke. Little tiny clots. We'd like to be able to treat those clots when we first see a patient because time is muscle, time is brain. The longer you delay, more heart muscle dies, more brain dies. We'd like to have a system where in an ambulance we could begin a treatment immediately and bust a clock. Now this was attempted years ago with certain level of success. Um, the major problems were when you give these drugs, you fill up the whole body with it. So you have a bleeding problem. Sometimes you have a bleeding problem into the brain. You're trying to treat the heart and now you've got a, a brain bleed. Not a good idea. These, these device, the, 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 the initial drugs weren't as safe as it, and effective as we had hoped they would be. And so that was abandoned. That doesn't mean it was a bad idea to treat these pe people earlier. So now what we want to do is think of a site-specific clot buster. How can we take something directly to only the clot, a payload, if you will? We can develop a payload and deliver that payload maybe with nano type of approach, we can put an antibody, antibody on the, the nanoparticle that will attach itself only to a clot. Our problem is, how do we deliver that payload? And that's been the biggest problem for us right now, is we think we can get a payload to the site. What we need to do now is release that payload. And that is one of the areas that we're kind of struggling with, but that, would have huge implications in terms of the number of people that have strokes and heart attacks in the world today, uh, in some parts of the world. In the United States, we think we've got it a little bit under control. We really don't. In other parts of the world, this is a growing problem. And so uh, I think treating little tiny clots is where one area that I would like to think that we would have some cross-industry intellectual uh, contributions. Kirk, what's what's the what's the one big thing that you keeps you up at night? Unfortunately, it's not one. There's <laughs> uh, you know, again, I, I talked about uh, something that's reliable, has to be lightweight. Uh, we 
use very little power and consume a, a, a little, very tiny volume. So almost everything that, uh, that we use today, both here on the planet, which you have to be able to use on orbit, is, is, is forced to take that same, uh, same kind of issue. So a whole host of them. But let me mention one. Uh, one of the big issues we have in our systems, uh, which affects reliability, is contamination in, in our water and our water systems. And we use water because it's safe. We actually use water for cooling inside, uh, inside the, the spacecraft. Um, we use water to uh, electrolyze and produce oxygen. We use water to hydrate our, our, our food, um, water systems, and we reclaim, we reclaim water from everything. We reclaim it from the air, we reclaim it from the urine. Um, because it's, it's, it's heavy, it's also required for life. Contamination of, of those water systems, biologically and non-biologically, is a, a critical problem for us. And the reason is, of course, as you can imagine, you contaminate you, uh, you can actually clog up very, very tiny orifices and the system stops working, um, or they become un unhealthy for, uh, for humans to consume. So we need to be able to clean up, we, we need to keep the water uh, the, the, in the condition that we'd like to have it, um, and, uh, and that's, a, that's a big problem. How do we do that in the, our unique environment? And our unique environment is this. Um, in space, um, the, uh, just the atmosphere that we're, the astronauts breathe tends to be much, much higher concentration uh, in carbon dioxide. And a lot of materials that we use to hose, to, to hold the water, are permeable to carbon dioxide. So the water has a tendency to become acidic, slightly acidic, but acidic, um, which poses problems. Now it's acidic, and it'll actually start eating away on some of the metals in our system. Um, biologically, you can create a biofilm, again, which can the system. And the, the real insidiousness of these problems is that they don't show up on the first day that you turn them on, and they don't show up on the tenth day that you turn them on. They show up a hundred days. In. And the nature of space is that uh, you'll be nice and close to home for a few days before you actually get burned as soon as you fly a ways away. Everything will look like it's working great until you start it on an irreversible journey, the one that takes you, even if, for instance, it's close to the moon, and the moon once you burn to go to the moon, you were going to the moon. If you watched the movie Apollo 13, there was no turning around and coming back. You had to go around the moon and come back. When we ultimately send humans to an asteroid, we send humans to Mars, which might be on the order of a few years of the journey. Once you do that burn to go, you're, you're committed, you're going. And so uh, having your systems clog up with the bio, uh, biomass or having uh, precipitates come out, non-biological precipitates come out and, and contaminate is a really critical problem for us. So um, anyway, that's, uh, that, that's kind of a generic problem, but a really, a really big problem for us. And, and, uh, and we're working not only with NASA engineers, but engineers from, from around the country, really around the world, on, uh, on this particular problem. And we appreciate your help. Okay. And that's the nature of our business. We are global, we are connected, and we can all reach out to one another. We're getting near the end of the session, but I do want to squeeze in. Does somebody have a question they want to answer this, uh, this panel? All right, time for one. Ah, oh, well, yes. Uh, you know, is this, is we, we're going to have a prize for the, the greatest one. Okay. Um, here's one. What kind of synergies, neither of you were, th were with the automotive industry, what kind of synergies do you envision for collaboration with the automotive industry? Rustin.
industries aggressively working on it. You want to minimize the exposure to human beings on the rig side. And so automation is a huge thing uh, for us. Everything we do, both in the surface, subsea, and subsurface, uh, automation is a big thing. You see the robotics uh, downhole, uh, underwater robotics that make up, break up fiber webbing, things like that. So the industry's come a long way. But especially the rig flow, we would love to see a complete automation. And one of my, one of my colleagues said best summed it up when he was talking automation. And I always laugh when I think about this because he said in the future of offshore rig, there are only two people on the, on the, on the offshore floor. It will be a man and a dog. And there should be plenty to take care of the rig. So the question you ask yourself, uh, why a man and a dog? The man on the rig is strictly to make sure the dog gets fed every time. It's time to feed him. And the dog is to make sure the man doesn't touch any of the things. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the that's the that's kind of our future of automation that we visualize. So yes. Automation is a big thing. Right. You know, uh, whether it's the automotive industry, the uh, the electronics industry, oil and gas, man spice flight, me man, uh, medicine. I'll end with the, with the quote of uh, one of our founders, Dr. Lumsden. It is all pumps and pipes. Think about it. So summarizing, I do hope this session uh, did shed some light on our theme of inspiring innovation. All of us are in different areas of endeavor, and all of us are trying as hard as we can to create our own ripples. And these three panelists I, have created some big ripples. For innovation to occur, however, these ripples must intersect. So let's keep on talking, continue intersecting, and borrowing from each other's toolboxes. It's been a privilege and an honor. Thank you. Thank you. What an extraordinary panel. Another round of applause for this extraordinary panel. And I have a small token of appreciation for each of you, if I can hand it out real quick.